Well, guys, it's been a uh, it's been an interesting week here. First of all, I want to apologize because uh, we're supposed to have the war ballooning event out back and actually do it on site. I had uh, previously gotten approval from the FAA and uh, other government organizations, including the Riviera, for for doing the war balloon out back of the facility here. Um, that went up okay up until about a week ago, and then we were informed that. Uh, uh, the city officials, among other people, said we couldn't bring the balloon on the property. So it sort of, sort of put a damper on our, uh, on our on-site uh, war ballooning. So I apologize to any of you guys that missed that. However, what we did, we, uh, me, me and my colleagues here at Tenasty, Team Tenasty sitting right here, decided to uh, take matters into our own hands, and we get, rented a Penske truck. We uh, set it up behind the Treasure Island Casino, and we did the war ballooning covert operation on Friday, and it went great. I think you guys are going to enjoy the video. Um, we got that. And, of course, here's the gizmo that was hanging under the balloon. Um, we'll, with that, we'll go into the uh, presentation here. So um, about war ballooning, I did a presentation two years ago that was called War Rocketing. And, and the problem with it was what was I put an access point and, and up inside the rocket, and, and the problem was the stumbling time was very limited coming down. It went to about 7,000 feet, but, you know, you can't give me any access points in about three minutes and a half. So we thought we'd do it better this time. Uh, Renderman and uh, the Prez 98, several others came up to me after my speech last time and said, hey, you know, a balloon would probably be a good idea. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not bad. So uh, the whole concept is here is if you're war driving, you're not, you're not hitting a lot of targets that are far out because, um, you know, you got buildings and trees and stuff. You maybe get 30 per block, something like that. We wanted to get a little more visibility. So the war balloon here we did is 150 feet up. I mean, the war balloon we did in the city, we're limited to 150 feet, but it was still pretty good. Um, as I said, that, that height is perfect for covering five, ten mile urban areas because basically it's the same height as a cell tower. And we all know that the cell companies are in business. If, they're, uh, if their access points were on the ground, then your reception would suck. So please feel free to stop me during the talk uh, if you have questions. Um, as I said, this evolved from out of war rocketing that I gave at DEF CON 14. We'll do a, a few good and bad comparisons technically about how uh, that went versus the balloon. Um, the war balloon components, how I built it. Basically, this is just a webcam that's movable via a uh, web server on the Internet or our local network in this case, which is a fiber, local uh, secured fiber optic network. And we have a WRT54G running Kismet drone inside of it. Uh, here is the rocket. Uh, quite frankly, the rocket w caused a lot more buzz than the uh, net stumbling targets we got last time. It was a lot of fun, but uh, didn't, didn't d get really get a lot of targets. Here's our new platform, the balloon that we can't bring on site, so we brought some substitutes here. This is a professional photography balloon. If you'll notice, it has the, uh, the pads on it, and, and a lot of companies use it now to do real estate surveys and that kind of stuff. Um, the war rocket was, was a cool idea, however, explosives permits required. They want to like actually allow you to shoot that near any populated areas, which is probably a good idea. Uh, and the stumbling was lifted to, uh, limited the parachute drift time. Uh, balloon, ballooning has its challenges as well because, uh, as you all know, helium is very expensive. Basically, it, it, it comes out to cost of 20 bucks per pound that you want to lift. So if you guys want to fly something, I highly recommend making it really light. Um, a little more accepted by authorities. Like I said, we started out with approval three months ago and, and actually got FAA approval first. It was not a big deal. I'll talk more about that later. And, of course, it's still restricted near airports, the same as anything else flying. A little, a little bit of the history. Uh, Benjamin Franklin recognized the military capabilities when the first balloon was launched in France in 1783. I believe that was a hot air balloon and wrote a lot about, hey, it was going to be great for aerial reconnaissance. Uh, of course, we have the classic, the Zeppelins in World War II, which the Germans used for both uh, aerial surveillance and 
bombing to a limited extent. They weren't real successful with the, uh, with the bombing raids with those. And then here's a little known project that's, that's uh, named Genetrix. In 1953, the Air Force and the CIA actually deployed camera balloons over the Soviet Union. Uh, these, these were phased out with the uh, first flights of the U-2. So uh, the government's been doing this for quite some time. Um, currently, I think there's some projects in Iraq, which I can't talk about. But um, Finally, aerostats, I don't know if you guys knew this, but aerostats, nothing but Air Force parlance for a big tethered balloon, uh, currently fly over the Mexican border and the Florida Keys. They crank theirs up to 15,000 feet and do a footprint of about 185 square miles. These are used to track, uh, they ha of course, they hang radar from theirs. They're used to track small flying, uh, low flying aircraft. And the beauty of it is they, can, they, they pump them up there and they can withstand winds of like 75 miles per hour. So they operate virtually without any break, very low cost, 5% uh, of the cost it would, ta it would take to send up an airplane or a chopper to do these missions. Um, as I said before, the stumbling con concept is basically think of us as a big mobile, uh, our, us in the Penske truck, we were a big mobile cell tower site. As soon as we throw the balloon out the back of that sucker, it goes up to 150 feet. Well, guess what? We don't need to build no cell tower because now we got all the 802.11b targets within that footprint. This was my first idea that I... The first thing I grappled with, with trying to uh, put all this stuff up in the air was, you know, you can't just hang electronics from strings. It doesn't work too well. So I got one of these big orange traffic cones, and I said, okay, it's going nice to be nice and stable, and I can fit everything in there. You know, it'll look cool. Wrong. Don't ever try to build anything in a traffic cone. They suck. <laughs> I'm also told that by my fellow engineers that... Uh, Rick, you know, if you want to show your drawing, you know, why don't you get a copy of Vizio, dude? You really can't draw. You're not Joe Grant, okay? So, you know, stick with the Vizios. Anyway, the first, the first thoughts, and um, I think this was a bar in Reston. Um, as far as designing it, all the components obviously had to be very light and low power consumption. This fiber that, goes, that went up to the balloon is solely for communications. All the webcam, I mean the webcam, the WRT in there, and as well as the fiber optic link had to, ha had to be supplied with power. Um, the other design considerations are safety, of course. You don't want to use uh, hydrogen. It's very, very flammable. And the Riviera, amongst others, demanded that this be passive, which was, it's a Kismet drone. It is only, it's receive only, if you guys know, know how that works. Um, already said this, balloon mentioned uh, the balloon is used for professional area photography. WRT54G version 3. Do not use version 1 ever if you guys are into hacking WRTs and hook it up to a 12 volt power supply. My first one made a cloud of smoke about to fill the path of my kitchen when I turned it on. So the specs say it'll take it. It won't. Um, what I packed this thing with was a bunch of lithium ion batteries, very similar to your laptop batteries. Uh, to, for power, I need one 9-volt source and one 12-volt source. That's eight AA batteries, by the way, and two 9-volt lithium batteries. The other hardware components we used, to, we only used the Yagi antenna because it's 15 dB and it hits a lot of targets. And it was practically a windless day Friday when we, la when we launched the balloon. So I did have other antennas, which I'll sh show you guys after the talk. One's pretty cool PC board. It's basically about three inches square, and it's highly directional. So I'll show you guys that if you're interested. The container, uh, my better half here, Diana, was we were sitting around the kitchen as I was struggling trying to put uh, crap, stuff a bunch of crap in a traffic cone. And I looked over at her cooler, and I said, honey, you, um, do you really have a need for that cooler? I said, I could probably buy you a new one. So she donated her cooler, and here, here it is today. It worked out great. If you don't know, the Iglo, the Iglo cooler is... Uh, this is one of the oldest products still made in America, and it's nothing but plastic uh, with styrofoam inside of it. So it's perfect for electronic isolation and making sure your stuff doesn't short out and burn out, which is, I mean, it burn up, which is a very bad thing to happen after you put a couple months work into it. Um, 
Here's, here's a distribution of all the stuff that went into the uh, war balloon payload. Believe it or not, just that cable there comprises 30% uh, of the weight. That's about a pound and a half a cable. But basically, it's a, a pound per 100 feet. So you could probably get away with another two to 300 foot of cable, but your, your ceiling on this particular payload is about 500 feet. Uh, the other things, of course, the batteries are big, big hitter. Electronics come in pretty small. At the, the WRT and the fiber optic converter uh, and the hardware and antenna are only 6% of the weight apiece. Very critical. This whole thing weighs three and a half pounds without the cable. Uh, for the software components, I, I burned Talisman 1.3.6 on the uh, WRT54G. Uh, the D-Link, which is the cool security camera I'm going to use back at my house for uh, monitor monitoring uh, m my house over the Internet, is got a web server on board and is remotely steerable over the Internet and addressable using DDNS. The SUSE, I, I used two laptops for this venture. One was SUSE Linux, which is one of my, my favorite distribution. Uh, needed that for the Kismet server to, and to talk to, to gather all the wireless data. And another add-on, which one of my colleagues recommended to me, was speech synthesis software. And was really neat during the, the flight because we could hear as well as see when the new networks came in as the balloon went higher and higher. Kismac, you guys are probably familiar with that, did some of my analysis of that. I've got a, got a Mac friend and who donated his Mac to me for this project. And then various Unix utilities. We secure shelled in and, and made it super secure since we were... Um, Supposedly going to be operating on site here. Um, the network itself, of course, is passive monitoring only. Uh, the data is streamed from the WRT on here to the Kismet server on the Linux box to the hard drive and save there. And of course, it saves all the files. The one we're going to publish after the uh, after the conference is the is the uh, comma delimited file. Um, I think we already talked about the camera here. We were thinking about doing a um, a cell phone link and broadcasting it, broadcasting out to the conference. However, that became problematic since we weren't on site. This camera, like I said, is addressable via DDNS over the internet, and you can hit it with a G3 cell phone. Um, the Riviera made me. Uh, <laughs> Well aware and of the as well as the DEFCON staff of the security considerations here, this is a secure standalone network. This is what the whole thing looks like. It's um, it is uh, the big balloon you see there. The cam, the cam and the configuration we flew hung underneath, of course. Uh, this one we just mounted up here so we could carry it in the room easily. The WRT 54G is inside of it, and of course the antenna pointed uh, straight towards the horizon, basically. Um, go into a little bit of the hardware and software hacks I had to had to do to uh, get this project going. This is your WRT 54G taken out of the case, and what we had to do here is is if you see that connector on the right. That actually had to go up top to, get, to feed the wire out of the cooler. I had to uh, deftly chop that sucker off with a, um, with a little Dremel tool and mount it up top. And these, these things are very delicate. I don't know if you guys ever work with any microwave or any, any very small electronics, but it's, it's very delicate work. So that was the first hack, remove the case. The case weighs about three times what the uh, actual circuit board you need does. Um, the D-Link camera, I wanted to, uh, you know, it's like a $250 camera. I didn't like want to toss it in the trash or lose it since I want it for my house. I took it apart gently, and you can see in the picture here on the left, it's just a little tiny circuit board and a motor that runs in there. It goes into, it uh, both pans and tilts. So my problem there was to uh, mount the antenna securely to it. I drilled a couple holes in each side on the arms. And as you can see here, it, it worked out okay. That's about the lightest antenna you can buy that, that'll uh, give you 15 dB. I think the antenna light weighs like three and a half ounces. So thank you Lowe's store for that. All the hardware came from Lowe's. Um, the uh, finish unit you see on the right is, is just like it flew on the balloon. 
the um, we already went through this stuff. You basically the fiber is just regular computer room fiber, uh, multi mode, six, uh, sixty five millimeters, something like that. I don't remember. It's regular computer room cable. Here's the fiber optic transceiver. I had to have two of these, one up, one up in the air and one on the ground. We had to remove the case because it was very heavy. You can see that in the back side of the cooler there. And here's the finished product. If you open up the top of it, like I say, the cooler worked out great. There's, there's the battery packs. Those will uh, run the, the war balloon for about two hours. Um, I was going to do a little short device demo, but since we didn't have time to hook up here, we're, we're going to skip that for right now. Um, one thing I did want to touch on is a very popular topic these days is IP-based robotics. I've done some of this as far as I, I worked in an automotive uh, assembly plant for about 10 years and did a lot of Siemens work, a lot of, a lot of Monocons. And in the early days, like 10 years ago, this started out as monitoring machines on the production floor and mainly for, uh, you know, statistical and how many parts did you make per day kind of deal. However, lately, uh, industrial control has gotten heavily into actually remote control, which, you know, can be a good thing, but can also be very dangerous if you're making car parts and got people walking around the machines and stuff. But you, you, you want to be around a 50-ton ram when it comes down because some idiot or, you know, got, in, got into your machine. Um, as a consequence, all the PLCs, at least, that I've worked with now come with interlock switches and stuff that will turn the memory on. You can't actually write to any memory without, without physically being there or talking to somebody. Um, anyway, there's a, web, a website that's got some cool IP remote control stuff on it, controlbyweb.com. Security, of course, is becoming the Achilles heel for, SCADA, uh, for all the SCADA stuff. It's always been the Achilles heel. Uh, it's just been it's it's been sort of in the background because not a lot of thank goodness not a lot of attacks have occurred so far. Um, one company I do want to mention that that I, I I know the guys and have done some work with is Digital Bond. They have uh, out uh, of course the latest thing is all the Nessus plugins for SCADA systems. If you're doing any kind of industrial control, uh, this this stuff uh, comes highly recommended. Uh, some of my colleagues work down at the Department of Homeland Security and. Uh, you know, you guys know any SCADA security work, please let us know. Department of Energy uses this uh, IP-based, I mean, uses SCADA security surveys extensively. And there's Digital Bond's website, www.digitalbond.com. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about why I've had such a long week. Uh, like I said, we started this whole approval process three months ago. Um, I will confess to having friends at the FAA because I've worked there, and also I'm a high-power rocketeer, so I, I have to call these guys routinely. I know who to call, right, to, to shoot my rocket up 7,000 feet. So it really wasn't that tough getting FAA approval. Um, after that, we had gotten Riviera approval, which was about a month ago, and then I'll talk in a second here about the developments just before DEF CON, which was like last Friday. Um, the following is my letter to the Las, Ve the Las Vegas Terminal Radar Approach Control, affectionately known in the FAA as the TRACON, who's the guy out here. He controls uh, the airspace, I think, 185-mile circle around Las Vegas. So he's, he's the man that can say, yeah, you can fly your balloon within five miles of the airport or, you know, go away. You're out of your mind. You can't do this. So here's a little letter I sent him. Um, this comes from the FAA regulations. I think it's Part 101 or Part 103 for moored balloons and kites. And the biggest thing they're concerned about with is you being near uh, the airport. You know, you don't want to ruin somebody's day that's coming in for vacation on a, on a Boeing 747 or something. Very, very bad form. So I'd recommend if any of you guys want to do war ballooning, the first thing you need to look out for is make, make sure you're not near an airport. You know, Google Earth is very useful for this, and anybody that's a pilot can help you out with that. But there are two in the Vegas area. We avoided those during our covert mission at, at, as far as the five-mile radius. They're, they're pretty hard up on that, and they will arrest you for flying stuff near the airport. Um, so anyway, here's the letter. What it boils down to is you, you can fly your balloon if it's no bigger than six foot in diameter and 113-foot helium capacity. Basically, that's probably 
three quarters of a uh, full size helium tank, something like that. I think they're like 180 or 200. Um, if it's below that and it's outside the airport, five mile perimeter, then it's considered no different from one of these uh, flying advertising balloons you see at the car dealership. So you really don't need to notify anybody. As long as you meet those criteria, and you can look that up online at, if, if, at FAA.gov. I mean, there, there's the whole regulation thing there. Um, this was our plan. We were going to operate an unmanned tethered balloon moored via the supply tether, tether line from the edge. Actually, it was the back of the Riviera Convention Center. Um, I think you, some of you guys probably saw it on the map. And Again, I apologize we weren't there, but beyond our control. Balloon, 3.5-pound payload. That's as big as you can get to. That's in the regulations. If you can't build it lighter than that, I don't recommend you fly it near the airport. They also made us equip it with a um, self-deploying parachute capable of lowering the payload. I guess you don't want to ruin somebody's day hitting them in the head with an igloo cooler. Uh, so, you know, easy for me, again, because I fly like 25- and 30-pound rockets. I had plenty of parachutes. Actually, my honey there designed the uh, rainbow-colored chute. I'm sorry you guys didn't get to see it. I forgot to bring it today. Um, the other thing is if you're flying near skyscrapers like we would have been down here, you can pretty much go up to 500 feet go. If you're shielded by a skyscraper, you're fairly safe in whatever you want to fly as far as a tethered balloon or kite because obviously the planes are going over. The skyscraper is going to shield, going to shield your operation. So they're, they're pretty comfortable with that. In our case, the Turnberry Towers, is, there's a huge towers right across the street from our, uh, it was going to be from our proposed launch site. Um, considered some alternatives. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this one, but this is uh, some insane man in L.A. that got like, I think this took like 50 balloons. And these, these are almost as big as the six-foot diameter balloon that we, uh, that we use for our war ballooning project. Um, just think of the money this guy spent, okay? I mean, that's 20 bucks per pound. I don't know what he weighed. But I would have personally just flown first class, you know, like on Virgin Airlines or something. I mean, come on. All right. So, like I said, we we were we were pretty much in angst about this the first of the week. We, uh, Diana and I have been, and my team Tenacity have been in Vegas here for about a week. And we said, failure is not an option. You know what? We're going to do this. And I thought about it, and I said... Yeah, rolling out helium tanks, the cops are looking for us. Probably not a good idea to, like, put a lot of laptops on the ground. So, hey, we went out and got in one of these big Penske trucks, 22 foot long, nice moving trucks. Conveniently, 22 feet by 7 feet by 7 feet. Our balloon is 6 feet. Um, so basically took all the, all the network gear and stuff that we had ready to rock and roll for DEFCON here, and we packed it and pre-staged the balloon and equipment out back of the uh, Treasure Island Casino where we're staying. And I had a couple, we actually inflated the balloon behind there in the truck so we could minimize our time on site and drove out to Site X, which is basically in the western part of uh, Las Vegas City. And so with that, I've got our 10-minute uh, video of our operation I think you guys are going to enjoy here. Let me get it fired up here. Any questions before I launch into the video, guys? All righty. Let me make sure I have some volume here, guys. All right, here we go, the covert war ballooning operation. We're here for the war ballooning uh, Plan B. Since we couldn't appear on the uh, Riviera site, in true DEF CON fashion, we've got assembled Team Tenacity here, and this is the war ballooning truck. So everybody's going to get together. We're going to load it up, pre-stage it, and get all the network gear and stuff ready to go. The idea is here is the balloon's going to be inside the truck, ready to roll, and we're going to pull up the site the site or sites and just push it out and, and uh, collect our data and stuff. So uh, 
we're going to be working to set it up, and we'll, we'll see you guys on the Friday night in, uh, in about an hour. So. Uh, you can just loop it through there if you want. Just a thought. Just a thought. By the way, don't try this in an enclosed container with the doors shut. Helium is, will replace all the oxygen in the room. So here we are. We just arrived at, at the site. Beauty. We have a hole It's going to go quick once we put it out. Oh, no, it's just 150 feet of line, so you just slowly turn it up. Yeah, we're going to take the fiber to it if it goes up. Yeah. Where's that blue tape? It's over in that bag. I got it here. Hold on. Make sure you clear that fiber. Guys, yeah, so what you're seeing, we were struggling a little bit because we didn't have enough helium to bloom when we started out. So it's actually it's going to go it's going to go high in just a second.
Uh, we got the horizon now. That's good. This is the fun part. Trying to get stuck on his lines. There you go. Now you go. Go the other way. Go the other way. Network detected. SSID. Channel 11. Are the cops here? He just heard. Do you think you have enough data? Let's look and see how many we got. I'd like to get some more aerial shots, actually. Let's try that. I mean, if we get a little higher, we get some more aerial shots. We see it won't go up. New network detected. SSID. VGKIDA 011. Channel 6. The can's working fine. Network detected. SSID. VGKIDA 011. What's going on? Network encrypted. Oh yeah, he's got it. Oh yeah, we got all kinds of neighborhood shots here. Yeah, it looks like like we lost our uh, up capability, but it'd be nice if we get a little more. Yeah, we're getting video feed of the neighborhood all around, but. I, yeah, the, for some up down on the lens for some reason. Network detected. SSID. Do wire for seventy seven. Channel oh, eleven. Network encrypted. I don't know how many hundred we're up to now. We're up to SSID. Linksys. Channel six. Yeah, I think. That was awesome. The things we do for DEF CON. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to my mates, too, who helped me pull this off up here. Team Tenacity. Um, we, my adrenaline obviously got up a little bit at the end there because one of the, one of the things the Riff told us when we were canceled was, you know, the Vegas Metro Police had called down here and some people had complained about us flying a war balloon. I can't imagine non-IT people being worried about a war balloon, but... Uh, <laughs> In any event, it, we couldn't have paid money for that. It was it was great. The guy showed up and uh, obviously thought we were just flying a balloon for kids or whatever. And that that was uh, <laughs> it was near a city park, by the way. So that that, that was great. Um, let me just show you some of the results here. Um, it, it it was just like a war driver's dream here because as the balloon kept getting higher, I couldn't even control the screen. That the networks were rolling in so fast, I, I had no idea how many were there. So um, let me go over the results a little bit. And I'll give you a couple of uh, aerial shots from the balloon, which was pretty neat. Uh, 
now. Actually, I just need to open up my notes file, I mean my um, Excel spreadsheet here. All right, so uh, we actually got, well, I thought it was 370, but I think there's a header line, something like 369 or 370 networks in a little around 15 minutes, which is pretty phenomenal. I don't know if you guys are experienced word drivers, but those of you who are know it would take quite a bit of driving around to do that. Um, some of the things we hit, it actually worked out better than what I have on site because we were five miles out. If you saw in the uh, video clip there, you could actually see we had scanned the whole Vegas Strip. And <laughs> it's, it's one thing, our, you know, we were five miles out, so we got a seven and a half mile range on this antenna. We, we, we basically scanned the entire strip. As you can see, we got Planet Hollywood here. We also got Mandalay Bay uh, somewhere up here. Let me see if I can find that one. But just, just tremendous reception. I mean, I, I, was, I was thrilled with it. I tried to talk my teammates into driving around a little more and just going out to sites and throwing the balloon out and doing it a couple more times. They weren't really keen on that after the cops showed up. So, you know. But, you know, I, I think it worked out okay. Let me go up here and show you guys a couple more things. One of the interesting things about war ballooning versus just war driving is, is you know, War drivers typically go around with GPS, which means, hey, okay, I found this wireless access point here. But where's here? Well, it's, it's really your car, right? I mean, it's not where you really found it. Get real. This one, the cool thing is, since the computer logs the first captured time, the Kismet, and the last seen time, actually first captured time is what we're interested in. If you notice the, um, well, let me just show you a shot, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. All right, so here's, here's one of the best shots that we got of the Vegas Strip. And Planet Hollywood just happens to be just to the left in the antenna there. And guess what? The Mandalay Bay site we picked up. And you can see how far out this is. I mean, it's, uh, this, is, this is no small shot for war driving. Um, this, this shows you the advantage. We're, we're, we're basically we're way up there and, and picked up a ton of targets off the Strip. Here's another shot. This is pointing right at DEF CON. If anybody can tell me uh, some networks to hunt for here, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go down the spreadsheet and see if they're there. But what, I, what I'm going to do is publish the CSV files. Uh, I'm not going to do any packet dumps or anything, but you guys are certainly welcome to uh, see our stumbling targets that we acquired dur during the uh, war ballooning effort. Another shot, this is a, a really pretty lake where we were and looking western, westerly out towards the mountains. Um, one of the concepts here was to be able to directionally aim the antenna, obviously, because then you can see where your targets are. Somewhat problematic with a regular car dealer kind of balloon. Had we not done it on site, I highly recommend one of these dirigibles, the Air Force and all the professional photographers. They're steerable and they tend to cock into the wind, so they're easily, they're more easily maneuverable. In our case, I really didn't have to use the webcam to rotate the antenna a lot because, uh, the balloon just naturally sort of sort of circled, which was great. All I had to do was maintain a horizon, and, and we got everything out there. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, I think we pretty much prove aerial platforms do provide superior line of sight to Wi-Fi targets. Um, it's easy to correlate the Kismet logs and camera targets. This, this works really good if you, if you compare the timestamps. You can look at a timestamp in the log and go look at the video of the uh, imprint of the time imprint on the video and see exactly what you were looking at. If you try war ballooning, I can tell you, get up early in the morning. It's like a fishing expedition. I'll, I drag all these guys out of bed at like 6 a.m. Wind is not your friend. Wind is calm in the morning. It will take your balloon down towards the ground. It will screw up your camera. It'll, it'll try to eat everything you've got up there. So, um, and also affects, you know, what kind of directional pointing capability you have. So, summing up, our expedition covered a 7.5 mile radius in the city of Las Vegas, snared 370 networks, and effectively surveyed the Las Vegas Strip, all in less than 15 minutes. Um, that's about it.
And I would just like to take this time to thank Team Tenacity and everybody who helped me put it together. Uh, Leo in particular for, for providing me some of the financial support and Eddie Mikulski for putting together this, this fine video. <laughs> Questions, anybody? Say again. The question was, what was the problem that the Riviera fi uh, finally didn't let us do it? I think it was upper management. Actually, I worked with the convention organizer here. Her name's Theresa Madsen. She was very helpful, and their IT security department had even approved this like a month ago. Um, we thought we were good to go. The uh, Riviera was going to get us a tent out back. We were going to hand out T-shirts, as we will here in the room across the way in just a minute. But we... I, I think upper management just freaked about it. Somebody in upper management did, and, and or the Vegas police called. Also understand that, you know, when word got out it was a war balloon. I, in retrospect, I should have probably called it the kismet eye in the sky, right? Because non-IT people, I, I mean, imagine that. Non-IT people are a little intimidated by these, this war stuff. So um, say again. And... The police, I, I never talked to the police directly. The only police we've seen is what we saw in the parking lot drive through. And I, I, would, I would venture a guess that if they were looking for us that they would have probably stopped. So, but, you know, that, that's about all I can say about that one. Any, any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, totally because that was the cheapest fiber transceiver I could get. It required two fibers. It was like 70 bucks. Hey, I'm a redundancy kind of guy, man. If you fly anything, you want redundancy. Any more questions? Can we transmit from this? Uh, that's a negative. It, it ran in passive mode. I actually did WL disassociate, WL passive, and I pushed the Kismet drone to the box every time. So, no, there was no transmit capability on this thing at all, and there never was any plan to do that. Yes. I'm probably done with flying for a while. <laughs> yeah, but that's not a bad idea. People have mentioned kites. You know, I mean, your only thing is if you want directional control or, or you, want, you want to do aerial photography, you know, your kite's going to sort of kind of doing this. If I showed you, actually, I can well, we have time to show them another short clip here. I'll show you some. I'll actually show you some of the, uh, the boat ride on the... Uh, it looks like riding a boat on, on the balloon, the footage, actual footage from the balloon. Hold on, I'll show you that. You can see what it looks like. We didn't show it because it, it looks like Blair Witch, quite frankly. Uh, approximately 70% of the networks were secure. Um, approximately 30% no encryption at all, including some of the bigger ones at the hotels. <laughs> On the strip, it was it was sort of shocking, but yeah, you'll see that we will publish the data. We can't publish obviously any any packet dumps or any any uh, reveal any personal info on there. But we will we'll show you that we'll publish that. Any more questions? You can see this is the thing taking off right now, and uh, it's it's pretty much the, the wild hair right here. Yes. Putting a compass on it, not a bad idea. I mean, if, if I had a, like a, a dirigible stable platform where it was not panning quite so badly as you see here, yeah, that, that's a great idea. That way you at least know where you were pointing. I, I knew from the layout where we were because I'd Google Earth this a bunch of times and seen, you know, like I said, you have to be very careful if you want to do this not to get near any airport and know exactly where, you're, where you are geographically. <laughs> no, unfortunately, you know, the power line deal becomes kind of dangerous. Um, you might want to, <laughs> one of the first things you need to do before you fly a balloon rocket or anything, make sure no power lines up there because, you know, even though it's not conductive, yeah, I wouldn't really want to try it. And, and it would probably ruin your balloon, balloon's day. Anybody else? Say again. 
Uh, I'm not aware of any aerial networks. I think we've got like 370 on the ground. And that was panning the entire skyline. So that's in that seven and a half mile circle. Oh, they were coming in very slowly. You know, I don't know. We, we were all focused on get her done. You know, we were on site and, and figured, hey, you know, the cops might be showing up. Well, they did. But uh, so we, we were, I can tell you probably half a screen worth or something like that. I don't know how many that is on the Kismet screen. But it wasn't. It wasn't tremendous. They just started rolling in as the thing went up, obviously. I, th I think probably 150 is about the optimal height for this thing. Uh, well, guys, we'll, we're uh, get, handing out some tenacity swag next door at the Q&A room, right, Jeff? That is correct. At the Q&A room. So you guys come on down. I'll be happy to entertain more questions or meet any of you guys. And uh, really enjoyed you coming out today. Thank you.